Welcome to the official Lost podcast, hosted by ABC.com. Well, it's a momentous day for Lost. The finale has aired, and the summer is upon us, which means lots of questions. And lots of time to ponder those questions. Luckily, the executive producers didn't want everyone going off into the sunset without having some of those questions at least mm, clarified. Such as, was that Matthew Fox in that cold, tundra-like bunker? Or wherever it was. Here now are executive producers Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse. Well, hi, Damon. Hi there, Carlton. Well, this is it, isn't it? It's our final podcast. For Ever. <laughs> I hope not, really, because this is... This is too much fun. I'm gonna miss these 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 quiet afternoons. And oh, don't get sentimental now. Podcast, Are you crying? I am. Are you crying now? <laughs> I am, oh my I am god! Crying. This is unbelievable. We're not. We haven't even started yet, and you're already crying. Well, you know, like a baby. It's. <laughs> <laughs> and, and at least it explains why I'm wearing diapers. I, <laughs> Wait, what? Well, I know. I mean, that's geez. another issue entirely. That is another issue. It's been a long season, apparently, it but has. you know. There are things that can be done for that problem. So this is a very special um, podcast that is sort of a, you know, a, a an after the fact, a Monday morning quarterbacking, if you will, Wrap about the about the finale, which aired uh, at last night as we were recording this podcast. So we're only beginning to just sort of get, um, you know, the fan reaction to the finale, which is good, great for us because you know we have been in a real bubble for the last uh, month. Literally, Damon has literally of, been in one of those plastic bubbles, like the Bubble Boy thing, which you know? explains the diaper. Because exactly. that way, you, you it's, cannot. It's very you clean. cannot just unzip the bubble. That's um, right. In any case, though the the reality is, is we, fin- we we started writing the finale just about a month ago, just about four and a half weeks ago, um, and uh, we wrote it uh, in conjunction with our amazing writing staff. Uh, very very quickly, it had to be written in order to produce in order to produce the two hours, um, in order to give everybody in Hawaii the the amount of time they needed to actually shoot it. It was actually shot in probably about seventeen, 17 days days with two um, two crews simultaneously at the same time, and then that's um, what simultaneously means. Is, it is. <laughs> wow, then I never realized had, that. Then then we had four editors working on it also simultaneously. Can three things be happening simultaneously? They can. Isn't that trimultaneously? Well, trimultaneously, quadrataneously, all four editors were cutting the finale. Very Santa Cruz. It was totally insane. We didn't really basically... So, yeah. uh, we locked the picture in about five days, and then we had to go uh, do special effects. And by we, I mean someone else. Yeah, well, um, we supervised them. Yeah, it's, it feels, at this point, throwing out names, you're definitely going to we're going we're going to forget something, but someone. But but the reality is, is there was a huge, huge effort made on the part of over 300 people in an effort to essentially pr- provide the finale that you watched last night in about three and a half weeks um, from the writing of it. it. It was so weird last night watching the Hala, um, that final moment when Penny Widmore picks up the phone and we looked at each other and said, wow, we shot that five days ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was so weird. There was no time between when we finished the show and when it aired. It was completely uh, unlike any other experience we've ever had on on this show. And, you know, I can't think of a show where I've seen something get put together as quickly as we did on this finale. Right, and it was so. a two-hour movie. And when you think about sort of the gags that we did, you know, having those helicopter shots with the boat out there and the, t- and the, and the, st- and the foot with the and toes and the... Magnetism. And the magnetism sequence and the lockdown and, you know, the, the, you know Desmond walking out of the prison. Like, it actually felt, you know, watching it, wow, it, it, you know... We, it's pretty big. They, they acquitted themselves very nicely in Hawaii. It, it looks good, so... Exactly. So, Damon, you want to talk about having Clancy Brown back on the show? I would like to talk about that. Clancy is an actor that uh, that, that we have uh, loved for a very, very long time, and obviously, we introduced him in uh, in one of them, another episode that Carlton and I wrote um, earlier this year, the episode where Henry Gale first shows up, and we show how Saeed became a torturer, and we this man Inman is the although his name is never spoken in the show, 
um, we, we named him Joe Inman because we knew that if we had called him Kelvin Inman, because in TV Guide they list the names of characters even if you don't name them, which is how people know Mr. Friendly's name was right. Mr. Friendly because we just call him that in the script. But because if we had named him Kelvin Inman, the audience immediately would have it would have been spoiled for them. Right. They would have known that this guy was going to be the same Kelvin that Desmond referred well, to. Well, his name is actually Kelvin Joe Inman. Is it? Yes, it is. I did not know that. Yes. Hold on, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I'm done. <laughs> Moving on. All right. The Four Toad Statue, uh, Carlton, let's talk about that. Is this something that you think that people should keep a, a careful eye on? Is there a big significance there? Or no. is it just another one of it's those nothing. things that's going to go it nowhere? It means nothing. It's just, you know, I, God, you just thought why, did they, cool. why did they even bother to point it out? I mean, you're, you know, I mean, it's sort of. I mean, my God, the woman is getting sick. She has to come back and look at this freaking statue. Who cares, really, frankly? Roughly, how big, you know, if the, how big do you think just the foot is? I think the foot is probably, if I were to be a uh, betting man, I would say that foot is probably 35 to 40 feet tall. So proportionally, we're talking a pretty dang big statue. Carlton, I will bet you $1 that that foot is 60 feet tall. Because really? you just said you were, if you uh, were a betting man. If I was man. a betting man? Well, I'm not a betting man, so All I right. can't uh, Well, I can't that, that'd be that my bet. guess. So if it's 60 feet tall, extrapolating that out um, simultaneously, how far would that make, how, how high would that make that statue? Simultaneously? I don't know. To, it depends on whether or not they're big-footed people. Yeah. You know, I mean they they're... could be very they could be very yeah. long in the leg and short in torso. They could have very small heads. Or maybe example. it's maybe it's actually got man's feet and a dog body. That's interesting. I mean, who's to say it's it actually a man? Does have four toes and that's four sort toes. of creepy. The, that, in all in all Homer Simpson has four toes. That's true. And four fingers. That could it could be maybe they worship at the cult of Homer Simpson. I think that would be a very interesting reveal and people would probably throw things at us if we would <laughs> reveal that. But in in all honesty, you know, the foot is is something that we've been planning for a while and is actually a lot of fun because we talk about this idea that the that the show is a big archaeological dig and and this was our way of sort of telling you guys, the audience, that you know we've been excavating the Dharma Initiative this season and season two, but it's time to begin the next excavation going into season three. And as we learn more about the others, we will begin to fundamentally find out that the Dharma. We know this about the Dharma Initiative. They didn't real. They haven't been here that long. I mean, the Dharma Initiative came in the late seventies. At least that's when the orientation film so, is dated. So who was here before they came? Well, what we can tell you now definitively is that season three will be in the post-Hellenic era, and everyone will be wearing togas and it will be actually really a bold move it'll sort of a cross between Rome and, and the loss that you, you used should really to know. tell me these things before we start the podcast because I get caught with my pants down literally well you don't have any pants on <laughs> I know, so exactly. what does it really matter I set myself um, up for that one. no but the archaeology as a concept for the show is a very important one and, and obviously that statue and who built it and those, Where the rest of it is. Uh, yeah, that's what I want to know. Yeah, well, that's a good thing to want to know. And 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 how those people figured into the history of the island of Lost is uh, is going to be cool to find out at some point. Awesome. Can we uh, talk about the Hala a little bit? Yeah, let's um, talk about the Hala. What? First of all, explain to me, Damon, why is it called the Hala? Well, every year we try to do a top secret scene that nobody knows about um, except for the sort of, you know, the people who need to shoot it. And last year it was the bagel. And that was Walt's abduction. And this year it was the Hala. And the Hala comprised of two scenes this year. The first part being our two uh, friends in the Arctic state. Well, we don't know Portuguese. if it's the Arctic, but they're Portuguese guys. Right. Um, we don't know where they are, but wherever they are, it's very cold. It's been People have been telling us. Or they could Ar- be Brazilian speaking pro- Portuguese, couldn't they? They could be, yeah. um, because that is, the, that is the language of Brazil. Yes, it is. But they are speaking Portuguese, and that was one part of the Hala. And then the second part was... Uh, the other side of it, which is the phone ringing in the bedroom and uh, pe- revealing Penny Win- Widmore, and 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 obviously, um, this is a much different uh, surpri- a big ending than it was last year because Walt getting abducted. I got to get that phone. There might be another magnetic anomaly detected. Okay. Sorry, Mister Cues, <laughs> we found it. <laughs> <laughs> your, I, think, your shoes. I think those are actually the keys to my <laughs> yeah. Prius, yeah, which exactly. I could not find this morning. But uh, but basically, this year the Hala w- is not as defined as last year's. It was Walt gets taken. You know what it is. Yeah. This year, it's sort of like I think people's heads are scrambling a little bit to kind of go, "What exactly did I just see? I just did I just leave the island for the first time? Here's this woman that I know has got this romantic uh, connection with Desmond, um, and and." 
Well, I think you did just leave the island for the first time in 49 hours. I think we did, other than in flashback. Right. But the reality is, uh, you know, you have no context for it. You know, has she been looking for it? How has she been looking for it? How long has she been looking for it? You know, all this stuff is hopefully, we're, we're hoping that the fans are talking about over the course of the summer. But we really just wanted to do, on an emotional level, a love story. And we thought it would be really cool that ultimately Desmond, in the triggering of the failsafe device... Um, and we will, in season three, begin to understand the real ramifications of what the white sky and all that stuff was, that it was that action that made the island visible to the woman who was looking for him. Right. And hopefully for, that a, came across. Just for a brief moment, though. Right, exactly. During the time that the, you know, the sound vibration was occurring, that the electromagnetic anomaly allowed the island to become visible for right. that brief moment. And those dudes refer to the fact that, hey, you're, we, we're going to miss it again. So the assumption might be, if I were a betting man, right. that the you first, are a betting that man. when they when they missed it, that so was, give me ten dollars. I will. Um, as soon as well, I, you don't have any place for I, your wallet. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I do have a place for my wallet, and that's why you don't want the ten dollars. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but forget the ten dollars. Yeah. I mean, maybe for a hundred dollars, I can go I, for how it. How can we even talk about electromagnetic anomalies now? I mean, we've completely. Um, gone I hope it's a waterproof it. wallet. Uh, it is, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You've lost even, your train of thought. Yeah, I was basically you? saying you don't even know what you're talking. One about. One might intuit that uh, that that there was another time that the island was briefly visible, right. and that just might have been September 22nd, 2004, I, when the last system failure occurred. I'd pay off that bet if you were a betting man. Well, you know what's interesting is is that I think there was actually a certain amount of confusion about the bagel last year. People thought they were pirates; they weren't sure they were the others. And I think that a little clarification from us and uh, a little. Um, discussion among the fans led people to the conclusion that rightfully Walt had been taken by the others and hopefully a few of the things we've said will clarify a few of your questions about but we don't want to holo. clarify it too much because obviously as is always on Lost what you think you are looking at might not be exactly what you are looking at and right. we, we have some well, clarifying cool. it a lot would be right. like who the heck are these Portuguese guys and why are they in some sort of Arctic or Antarctic shed and, and, and is one of them played by Matthew Fox no that is not. That the is case. not true. It is. I mean, and we're not. First of all, cutesy. Matthew Fox doesn't speak Portuguese, but that that is cutesy. But it isn't Matthew Fox. He's, he he speaks Brazilian Portuguese, but not Portugal Portuguese. He, yeah. Well, I just want to be clear on that. Okay. Um, one one other thing that we should talk about before we get to your questions, guys, um, is the way that that Lost is going to run next year, and this is very exciting for Carlton and, and I because we've been lobbying the network and the studio all season long to abolish reruns. Uh, we hate them, believe it or not, and we've talked about it on the podcast many times, just as much as you guys do. And fortunately for us, sort of Steve McPherson, um, who runs ABC, and uh, Jeff Bader, who is head of scheduling over there, really gotten behind this idea that, that the show runs best um, in blocks and uninterrupted by reruns. And when it's on, it's on, and when it's not on, it's not on. So it, as a result of all of, the, all of our hard work and the network and the studio's hard work, um, Next year, we will be premiering at the very end of September like we normally do. We're going to run six episodes um, through the beginning of November. Have and an awesome There will be like a mini cliffhanger um, at the end of that six episode, and then we're going to be off the air for about 12 weeks until February. And when we come back in the spring, the show will be on straight through, no repeats. Again, when Lost is on, it's on, and we're, we, are, we couldn't we're be happier. we have 17 straight episodes with no interruptions. Right. And although you're going to have to wait, you know, uh, and w the, we feel this is a good compromise because the other side of it would have been you had to wait all the way until January to get another episode of Lost. We feel by giving you the taste, the mini season, the six episodes will hopefully be, be helpful. Yeah, and, that would be uh, too long. It is it's definitely too long for me. And that way we can do podcasts again. Oh, exactly. Well, we can do them anyway. Even Why are you trying to, to climb into my bubble right now, Carlton? <laughs> Please, get out. Um, by the way, we, we are going to be... Uh, at Comic Con in San Diego in um, July, and we'll be having a panel there with some of the actors and Damon and and uh, and me. We'll be uh, Damon and I, whatever it is. We'll be on the show. Thursday, we'll be there. We'll be, we'll be at Comic Con, and and we will say this. We will tease this. If you are following the Lost Experience or are a fan of it and all this stuff that's right now going on with the Hanso Foundation, who is apparently very very upset with us. You might want to come to Comic-Con because we are going to be making an official announcement 
about our feelings about no. the Hansa Foundation and their meddling in our show and their attempts to sort of legally injunct us from using see, them. Did you see that guy, um, Hugh, Hugh McIntyre, McIntyre on yeah. Jimmy Kimmel last night? I haven't seen it, but you know I heard about it. He, he said he doesn't watch the show. He thinks it's too confusing. He said he tried watching it once but felt it was too confusing. Well, obviously... Well, you know what? The Hansa Foundation is too confusing. Take that, Hugh. <laughs> Take that to the bank. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Harsh words from Carlton. Take that to the I'm bank. I'm not happy about Hugh. Why is that not... Why is... How is that an insult? Take that to the bank. <laughs> is that... Is that going to ma- upset him? Oh, go make a time <laughs> deposit. <laughs> oh, dear. Exactly. <laughs> Open up an IRA. <laughs> that Take that. <laughs> I hope your interest rate is... Is, Unfashionably is very high. low. Very high. All right. Time for questions. Okay. Time for your questions. Cue the question music, Chris. <laughs> Okay. Huzzah! Huzzah. Wonderful as always. All right, Damon, in the May 19th podcast, you revealed that in the question Who's mark asking this episode, question? Oh, I'm sorry. This is Oz Spade. Okay. And the title of this question is Damie's Clammy Cold Hands. Oh, Nellie Olson. Here we go. The hands turning <laughs> on the lights are Damon's instead of Locke's. Uh, looking at that shot again, I can't help but notice how great Damon's hands look. They are in very fine shape and look so pristine and smooth. My question is, what kind of hand care lotion does Damon use? Any specific type of lotion that can be recommended? And has Damon ever thought of becoming a hand model? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. That was a multi-tiered question, and I'll start, uh, I'll start with the, the last part, and the answer is no. Uh, I have never thought about becoming a hand model, and uh, thank that you That is for, so untrue. I know. Like, when we couldn't come up with an idea for episode 214, you were like, I'm just, screw it, I'm going to become a hand model. I'm going to fulfill my dream of becoming a hand model. Uh, you Products? Know, the, the reality you use is, a hair exfoliator, don't you? Well, I like uh, I dip it in paraffin wax, and I allow that wax to sort off. of crystallize around it. And, and you uh, like that pain? Don't I you? try not to touch anything, um, ever, pretty yeah. much. And by doing by not touching anything, I'm able to give my hands a youthful, um, you know, clean and smooth appearance. I think there's a little kind of weird sort of contradiction in this question, though, because it says Damon's clammy cold hands, and yet here it says they're in fine shape and look pristine or smooth. So I'm not sure whether they really like your hands. Which part is facetious? I think you might have referred to in a, in a prior podcast is my is that my hands were cold and clammy. Oh, and this, I see. So it's this a, person is taking they're, issue they're taking with your with issue with me categorization. Well, sorry. Spoken from a man in a diaper. And you can take that to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> All right, up. Carlton, I have a question for you. Monster <laughs> question mark by Crazy Misfit. Oh, good. First off, I want to say I love your podcast. It makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. <laughs> I have a question that's been bugging me for a while now. Is it just me or did you guys dismiss the monster as no big deal? Is there a reason that the Losties are no longer afraid of it anymore? That's a good sense. You guys kind of were like, oh, smoke, hacks, forget all about it. Okay, thanks for your time. Well, <laughs> okay. It is true. Who really cares about the monster anymore? I, mean, I care. Now, the monster... Is, is it going to be... Carlton, is it going to be back in it, season three? The, the monster will definitely be back in season three. You know, it's just... We... It's hard to get around to doing, you know, stories that involve everything on the island all the time. And we did not... Uh, we, you know, we have actually a couple of other uh, good stories involving the monster. We just haven't, uh, we didn't get to them in season two the way everything was playing out. But I would actually dangle this out there, Carlton, and this might be a, dangle a, it. a, a fairly controversial statement, but it would be accurate. There's a good chance that you guys saw the monster this year, but just didn't realize you were looking at the monster. Oh, that is true. That's so. Oh, that's good. That, that's a pretty the, big one. By the end of next year, you will you You'll will understand realize what that means. You will understand, understand what that means, but. You will be able to take that since, to the bank. You, you can't. <laughs> since you're not confused enough already, you can take oh that to God. the bank. <laughs> exactly. Do you but, think people need any more like cryptic, you know, crypto talk? I sure do. Okay. If they're listening to this, they do. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. All right. Well, Damon, here's uh, l- l- let's just jump to a few things here. Hope you slept well last night. You sure earned it, says uh, Ibazark. <laughs> 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 Good morning, lads. Uh, now the season is over, can you really give us a little deconstructionist peek into how you and the writers got to this point? What really interests me is, how much did you know when you wrote the first season pilot? How much did you know going into season two? How much did you figure out as you wrote through season? How much do you know now, and how much will you know in the future? I added those last parts. Um, all right, let's just get on. What did, when did you know what was in the hatch? 
Our rule. There's a bunch of these questions, so you can just you know you don't have to be long winded about them. Okay. Well. No, okay. <laughs> Please just yikes. give me a quick answer. Uh, we again the fundamental rule on Lost is we don't introduce anything until we know how it resolves. So once you saw the hatch, we knew what was in it. So uh, I think Boone and Locke found it at the end of episode. Nine in season one, which was actually the eleventh hour of the show. Um, that was all the best cowboys have daddy issues. So that was around when we knew what was right. inside. Well, actually, all the questions are on the same axis, so, so they're the basically answer's the, the answer is the same to all of them. Um, Phew. Phew. All right. Okay. I, it's my turn because oh, you just sorry. you just wasted a valuable. I question know that right was there. really that wasn't as good as I'd hoped. Sorry. Producer question: Why didn't Hurley attack Michael? This is a serious one, um, and I think we should probably talk about yeah. it. By Ego Town. Um, why didn't Hurley attack Michael or at least show signs of anger when Michael admitted that he murdered Libby? Is he really that much of a coward? Thanks. Love the podcast. Um, you know, I, I think that that is a, that's kind of a legitimate question. I mean, you know, I think that there obviously were a lot of very kind of strong and deep conflicted emotions that all those characters had when it was revealed that Michael was a traitor and responsible for um, murdering um, Libby and Anna Lucia, but at that juncture in the storytelling, um, you know, I, I think that there really wasn't, we sort of felt as writers that they didn't really have much choice, that, that basically when Jack presented the, the alternative, going back, you know, basically was a more doomed scenario in his mind than actually continuing with the trek, and we, we felt that that was enough, maybe we should have spent a little more time dealing with the character's reaction to it, but that was the sort of given the choices, it felt like the character's best choice w- was to go forward at that point, and that the emotional right. reaction on a deeper level to what Michael did had to be deferred. And also, you know, the reality is, is we watching the finale, we agree. You know, that is a legitimate point, and sometimes, you know, character motivation becomes a casualty of the process, especially in a in a rush job like the finale. Which is not to say we don't plan out things in advance, but that's the first thing that sort of becomes a victim of circumstance and, and the reality is, is as I recall there were versions of scenes and a much longer version of that scene even at script where we dealt with precisely that issue in fact Sawyer also wanted to turn around and say at this, at this point it's stupid forget about it but in the show you look and the end of the scene is Sawyer says what plan and then you know for Jack to explain Saeed's going around the island and doing this that and the other thing we were like the audience kind of already knows that and unfortunately we lost that whole page of Right. You know, them saying, well, you know, well, screw this, you know, uh, he, Michael's a murderer, we don't want to have anything to do with, and, and then we needed them to continue anyway, so it was, it was a casualty of war, as it were, and, you know, this is a case where Carlton and I will literally come forward and say, we wish we had done it a little differently, you know, right. the characters sort of deserve the opportunity to explain their motivations better, and, and we wish, you know, we had done it. Yeah, okay, so now bend over so I can spank you. Whoa, I better take off my diaper so I can go to the bank. So this is a good kind of question to sum up the uh, where we are right now. Mm-hmm. This is from Booyah319. Oh, yeah. Uh, if season one was about trying to get off the island, dot, 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 or ellipse, as it were, if season one was about trying to get off the island and season two was about building more of a society with rules, what will season three be about? Or, in other words... Season one was trying to get into the hatch. Season two was about being in the hatch. And now that that's destroyed, uh, imploded, uh, as it were, what will season three be about? Presumably what Desmond did will prevent incidents happening every 108 minutes since there's no computer to input the numbers anymore, right? So that feels like there's some you know, some some ground there for you to... Yeah, that's trust. a really good... You know, the, the reality is is... We think it's really cool that people don't know exactly what season three is going to be about, but they do know roughly where it's going to start. And a big part of season three is going to be about why the others took Jack, Kate, and Sawyer. This is sort of a big fundamental mystery. Why were their names on that list? Hurley's name was obviously on the list because the others, for some reason, felt he would be the best person to deliver the message of the fact that his friends are now in cu- captivity. And when, Hen- I'm looking. when Henry says they're coming home with us, where is home? You know, what does he mean by home? And that's something that you're going to find out fairly quickly right out of the gate at the beginning of season three. But the mystery of why Jack, Kate, and Sawyer is fundamentally the story we're going to be telling over that batch of the first six episodes in the third season. And while while they will present sort of an external threat, I think that it's also fair to say season three will be a lot about our main characters, about their relationships, about getting 
deeper into the inner relationships between the core characters that you know and love, and that is something which I think we have we we've now earned, totally. you know, particularly on a romantic level, and and we are, you know, I, th- I think that you know, I, we sort of feel like we want to we want to service the relationships even more than the mythology next year, and um, you know, the mythology won't go away; it'll always be a part of the show, but. You know, it, it's we are really going to dig into uh, our character relationships. No, absolutely. And, you know, although that remains the core of the show and we've got a lot of awesome flashback stories to kind of go deeper, you know, we're going to find out, you know, in season three, sort of the big burning mysteries finally, you know, like Locke and how he got in the wheelchair and, um, you, you know, what, uh, how Jack got his tattoos. Those are stories we're going to be telling in the, in the third year of the show, finally. Kate's, and, Kate's marriage. And thanks for being patient uh, for all that stuff. But also, you know, our finales also function a lot. Their finale is almost the wrong word for them because in many ways they're usually sort of half pilot for the season that comes next. So it's like there's a lot of setup. So the idea that when, when Desmond turned that key and we heard that noise and there was this island-wide event where the sky went white. That was really set up for a lot of the stuff we're doing in season three um, and, and, and become sort of the new central mystery, which is exactly what did happen. Because right. the simple answer would be he blew up the hatch. Um, and, or that he blew himself up. But obviously, you know, if you see I really Penny... Hope, I hope there, Desmond's coming back. Yeah, then. I mean, it would be really, really bad if, if Desmond was dead. I would be bummed because after... I, I really invested in him and for two hours there, you... I don't. You have no. I have no idea why he went to military prison. And Ian like, Cusack did an incredible job. He is an awesome actor. Just to think, like here's a guy who was essentially a guest star, and you know, in one episode of the show prior to this, and then suddenly we we have to hang the entire season finale on his back. You know, it's yeah. it, the the analogy we use is you know you've been you know the backup quarterback on the bench for the entire season, and then the quarterback gets hurt right before the Super Bowl, and you start right. and win. Um, so in our our opinion, he did. He did such a good job. He's actually going to Disneyland today. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm so gullible. No, I'm, I have one final gullible. question for you, Carlton, and I think you're going to love this one. Of course, if you're wearing a diaper, gullibility isn't really much of an issue, is it? <laughs> it sure isn't. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, the Damon and Carlton by Casino Skunk. Now, I guess you are a betting man. I've been listening to your podcast for some time now, and I get the impression that you guys don't really feel like doing it. <laughs> you guys sound like you are forced to do this by ABC. When it comes to the fan questions portion of the show, you seem to come off as very sarcastic about how much you enjoy answering them. Maybe you two are just having fun with each other, but I feel that it comes off as insincere. I love what you guys do with the show Lost. I just hope that your podcast stop feeling so forced. By the way, my name is Ralph, so please don't make fun of my screen name. Thanks. Ralph, insincere, really. Huh. Uh, Chris, put the gun down. We will answer this question. We don't need the gun. You don't need to be pointing the gun at us. We will we will answer this question. I don't know. I mean, we we you actually don't understand. I mean, Ralph, I mean, to be to be, candid, to be let's be let's just be honest about it and I think we're wrapping up our final fo- podcast of the season and it's time to just be honest. We're really just doing it for the money. <laughs> Carlton and I are paid approximately $9,000 per part, po- per podcast each. <laughs> and the longer we talk, you know, beyond 10 minutes, for every minute beyond that, we get, an, we get another $500. Yeah, okay. Which is why we yammer on endlessly and seem no. so insincere. I mean, I don't understand you, Ralph. We love this. This is like one of our, this is like actually one of the favorite good things we get to do. We, we we enjoy hearing the sound of our own voices. <laughs> we do. <laughs> anyway, guys. And for the record, I think you're very sincere. I, well, thank you, Damon. I'm. I think. Now, you're well, are you too. crying, Carlton? Oh, <laughs> like, that's that's, know, that's that's so sweet. It's always a good way to end the season on a tear, isn't it? Really? Oh, jeez. Oh, Jesus. Guys, oh, thank, thank you, you so much for watching we, the show this season. <laughs> Hopefully, we haven't frustrated you too much. And if you've listened to the end of this, uh, I hope you have something good to do over the summer. Yeah, if you've made it this far, uh, Vi can Dios. All right, thanks, and we'll see you next year. Bye, guys. That concludes our special post-finale podcast. However, the summer fun isn't over yet. We'll periodically be offering up exclusive tidbits, especially as we get closer to Season 3. Starting off, we have a special post-finale interview with Malcolm David Kelly and Harold Perrineau. That'll be coming up in a couple of weeks. And then later in the summer, we'll be joining Damon and Carlton as they come at you from Comic-Con 2006. Finally, don't forget, you can catch the finale again for a limited time. Just go to lost.abc.com. 